my background actually is in uh, is in weather prediction. I worked for um, five years down in Maryland trying to improve forecasts made by the National Weather Service's you know big billion ten billion now variable models of the atmosphere predictions of what the weather's going to be like over the next couple weeks. And, uh, and so this field is, um, the field of atmospheric science, is one of the great success stories, I think, in, uh, in science. Because um, back in the 70s, we launched satellites and started taking pictures of the Earth and feeding all that data into computers that were growing in strength. And, uh, and now we can tell what the weather's going to be like a week from now. And there aren't many systems that are chaotic that we have any sense for what things are going to be like um, in the near future. So it's a great success story, and it happened because of data. Um, and, uh, and so I think I'll, I think I'll argue, and, and you'll see some examples um, and evidence of this, that that type of revolution is now happening in the social sciences because of the phones that you're all hanging on to and, uh, and the ways we communicate on the internet. So the goal that for at least the projects that I'm going to talk about today is to take the data that we produce on the internet and with our mobile phones and turn it into information that can help people in positions where you know, they're making public policy and decisions about investments and nutrition or, or uh, public health, and, um, and then also help individuals. Um, you know, you're being sold ads all the time, whether you, you know, you're selling your own behavior for ads all the time, and it'd be great if you also got some benefit out of it, aside from the occasional chocolate of meme. So um, we're gonna be talking about that too, not just the public health aspects, but just for individuals, how can we make, um, their lives happier and healthier. So I work with uh, Peter Dodds. Our group is the Computational Story Lab, and we have a robotic octopus um, that is um, the mascot for the Complex Systems Center. We have a new degree, a master's degree in complex systems and data science. PhD working its way through the system in complex systems and data science, and uh, now an undergrad degree in data science too. All because there's a lot of excitement about turning all this data um, about our behavior into uh, knowledge that we can use. So um, the plan for today is, uh, is to tell you about a couple of our projects. Um, I'll talk about an instrument that we're building, much like you know, the LIGO instrument that detected neutron stars colliding back when the dinosaurs were, um, dinosaurs were alive. And then you know, like back in August, the, the, the instrument detected that that happened. And it's, they measured the difference in physical space between these two arms um, smaller than a proton. So amazing things happen when you build instruments and start pointing them out at space. And we've built um, a very rudimentary, silly little instrument, and a few of them that I'll tell you about, um, that we're pointing at people and trying to understand you know, how it works. But it, it has, you know, the, the, our instruments have dials, um, despite being silly. They have knobs, because any good instrument has a knob. And we'll, we'll point it at different things, and, and I'll show you a few examples of, of what we found. Um, and if I have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, a project that we have where we're trying to uh, quantify statistical changes uh, and patterns of them in the US um, that, that relate to uh, how long the seasons are and what um, the warmest and coldest day of the year are, because those things are changing. I don't know if you noticed, but it's 60 right now. Um, okay, so here's sort of a, a big roadmap for our hedonometer project. Um, we're trying to understand human behavior. We have all these sources online. Um, people tweet things, they search for things on Google. Uh, they tend to be a little more honest in the things they search for. Um, and that data is available on an aggregate. Um, there's news articles, music lyrics, blogs, all these things. And um, we collect all this data. We collect actually about 50 million tweets a day, a random 10% of all the messages sent on Twitter. Um, if you wrote all of the tweets sent every day, there are 500 million down on Post-its. It would wrap around the equator one time. So for the last decade, we've been getting uh, a random 10% of all those. And we have about, about 100 million of them now. It represents about uh, 50 terabytes of storage compressed. Um, which is about a half a petabyte when you inflate it back up again. And we try and learn things from that. So the instrument I'll focus on um, for part of the talk is, is one where we look at trying to assign sentiment to tweets that are posted from uh, cities or by uh, people in a particular state or who visit parks. Um, that's the project Aaron is working on. And, uh, and the knob here is gonna, we're going to sort of resolve um, how many words we consider neutral near the middle. And just like you know, an instrument in physics where you'd want to dial up the um, amplitude of the signal, maybe at the expense of identifying a trend. We do that here with our instrument as well by masking out words that are either neutral, legitimately, like the and 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 of and the filler stuff, or words that are very context dependent and would require some sophisticated natural language processing tool to 
properly identify the sentiment of. Um, so the F word, for example, you're not going to see it anywhere in my slides because when people sit down and try and evaluate it without context, it's sort of their evaluations are all over the place. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, these are some examples of, of word scores. We have about 100,000 words in a dozen languages that we've crowdsourced sentiment scores for um, around the world by native speakers. So the things we look at, how, you know, how does our sentiment change as a function of the day of the week? People tend to be happier on Saturdays, not surprisingly. Um, this is a map in the U.S. of cities and where the happy and sad words uh, are used in cities. And it tends to correlate strongly with some socioeconomic data that I'll show you. And then obviously we have a lot of social network information. You have people that you follow and people who follow you. We try and understand how, um, how those connections, how things spread through social networks, um, you know, how much of your behaviors are you're imitating the people around you. And this has become really important now when we're thinking about a lot of the things influencing us that aren't human. So we have there are uh, accounts on, on Twitter and other social networks that, um, that are telling us a bunch of stuff and you know, we're, we're not sure who who the authors of those posts are. So this is sort of the roadmap, and I'll show you some examples of this. Um, I like to start with a fun example. So we, you know, how does this instrument work? Really, we just take all of the text that we're caring about into a big bag, and we shake it all up and assign a number to it. That's the average sentiment of all the words in the bag. So in this picture, it's um, all of the words spoken by Kramer on Seinfeld, and their average sentiment is about a 5.9, according to our instrument. He uses happy words like buddy and hey and happy more often um, than Seinfeld does, for example. So he's, his, his words are the saddest on that show. And you could do this by episode, or you could, but this is just all of the words together. So there's about 200,000 words that Kramer spoke over the course of the, the, um, the whole series. So that's the idea. Um, and so we don't typically go in and try and look at a sentence. That's a different sort of fancy sentiment analysis tool that uh, people develop. We don't do that sort of thing. We look at the, the stuff in aggregate. Twitter's important. Uh, here's a tweet from the AP account a few years ago. Two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama's injured. This message was posted by their account and went to two million people and the stock market dropped $100 billion the next minute because of algorithms that look for keywords like this. Um, and uh, fortunately, their account a few minutes later tweeted, actually, we were hacked by the Syrian Electronic Army, just kidding, and the stock market rebounded. Uh, but it's an example, and I used to have to explain first uh, 10 years ago what Twitter was, and now because of the fact that the president uses it so much, people understand it's important. But it's also like things happen in the world um, as a consequence of things that go on on Twitter, especially sort of uh, attacks that happen, cyber attacks. Um, so fortunately this bounced back. This is what that tweet looks like on our computer. When it arrived that day, there's the message itself, and then there's all this other stuff you've heard of the word metadata associated with posts like this. So the URL for the thumbnail image, and how many people follow you, and how many times it's been retweeted, and all that sort of stuff um, comes along with it. And if, there's, if somebody's used their phone, um, there's also the latitude and longitude, or the place that they're uh, affiliated with, or they self-declare where they are, things like that. Um, so like I said, we have, uh, we have lots of these. We don't read them. We have computers that read them. And then uh, we've written dozens of papers about uh, things that we found about our behavior. So. So one thing uh, that, that I can say is that there's a website where you can go and learn about some of the things we found. It's hedonometer.org, which has links to lots of these projects. And, uh, and what you're looking at now is the last decade, roughly, of, of daily sentiment, the average happiness of all the words written on Twitter in English um, over the last 10 years. And there's a few things that, that'll jump out at you. Um, first, I'll say sort of the obvious that Saturdays tend to be happier days. You can see the red Days are up, and Tuesdays tend to be sadder. Um, there's a very regular weekly cycle, or there was for many years, and it has since, um, since sort of the uh, beginning of 2016, it's kind of broken down. Um, so that's, that's uh, Twitter's changed since uh, you know, politics recently. Uh, you'll see that there are some happy days that are sort of outliers. The day same-sex marriage was declared legal in the U.S., this was a relatively happy day that wasn't on the calendar to begin with. Happy words being used more often. Holidays tend to be happy days. Each year these spikes, the biggest one is on Christmas. And then natural disasters, terrorist attacks, deaths of celebrities, um, they tend to be sad days. And they last typically one or two days. It's, it, it's a very ephemeral media. And so we're back on to talking about other stuff right away. Um, but you can see, you know, for instance, things that have happened recently. The day that um, Trump was elected, there's a lot of these negative words being used more often on the left. Um, 
That was one of the saddest days, according to our instrument, and these were all happy words being used more often on that day. The day of the mass shooting in Las Vegas, that was the saddest day that we measured over this period of time, so you get lots of negative words here, and this is interactive, so you can go and see how many of each and their contribution. Um, these are happy words being used more often that day, people expressing condolences and hoping for some changes. And then if you, uh, if you, if you want, you can sort of dial in here and play around. Uh, we worked hard on making this uh, something that was interactive. So Andy Reagan was a PhD student that worked with us on trying to um, make this something you could learn from and embed. So uh, yeah, so that's sort of the overall story for how this works. Um, there's a slow sinusoid going on that indicates that things indeed will be great again very soon. The fun just starts to take off. Uh, and, um, and we don't know why. We're learning about that right now by trying to, you know, just, it turns out there's a lot more negativity happening in here, sort of the filler words like no, can't, won't, don't, shouldn't. That stuff happens more often in this period than in this period. Um, but it's hard to know. And so we get a measurement from this instrument and we're trying to figure out why. Um, okay, so we've done things like look at individual neighborhoods and cities or, or, or city blocks. This is Chicago, and you can see happier words in the north part of the city, a lot of leisure, people going out to restaurants, brunch, um, theater. And in the south side of the city, people, you know, there's, there's a lot more poverty and people dealing with relationship issues. And you go and look there, you'll see that the words are shorter, and it's more about the life, their, their day-to-day life, and less about leisure. Um, it correlates pretty well with socioeconomic data from the area. We did this map of the U.S. Again, this is now using geolocated messages, and uh, Ellen DeGeneres covered it because the happiest city was Napa, so she sent a reporter out there, and she's standing there drinking wine and talking to people about <laughs> why it's happy. People in Napa start tweeting happy things. Check it out. Napa's the happiest place. And, um, and so, of course, positive feedback effect. The instrument responds, and Napa gets happier. And Beaumont, Texas was the saddest city. Uh, eggheads find Beaumont is the saddest city. <laughs> like the editors always knew at the newspaper in Beaumont. Uh, and then we had people writing on our blog about Beaumont for Beaumont. A lot of negativity coming out of Beaumont in response to this study. Um, <laughs> apparently they have crawfish boils where they're great, which are great, but otherwise it's like kind of a disaster there in Beaumont. So uh, this is anecdotal evidence, but it's very strong anecdotal evidence, and there was a lot of it. So in Beaumont, things, a lot of negativity and, and there. Um, score got sadder, unfortunately, for them. Backlash, people in Beaumont responding, uh, things aren't so bad here. So that was kind of fun. But, you know, in terms of the, like, what is this thing measuring, um, we, we looked at states and, for example, looked at um, each of these dots as a state, and its position here is how many people out of 100,000 die by gun deaths. So um, lots of gun deaths in these states out here. And this axis is um, the average happiness of the words written in that state that year. And you can see that this is a strong anti-correlation. It's about negative 0.66. So that's, um, that's showing that the instrument is um, responding in a way that reveals something about that the, um, this particular statistic. And we looked at a few others, like surveys. You know, People call you and find out how you're doing. And um, there's a whole movement that I'm sure you're aware of to try and use more holistic measures for how well society is functioning. And, we're a part of that conversation, trying to get this governments to do this sort of thing. So it, it actually is telling us something about um, about how people are doing, and it doesn't require collection of, of survey data or talking to hospitals, for example. Um, so we looked at a few other things like how people move around. Turns out we tweet happier words the further we get away from our house. Um, that's maybe not surprising to you. We're looking in uh, one of our current projects at uh, the relationship between well-being and nature. So uh, this is a picture Morgan Frank, one of our students, made um, showing you know, which types of areas, land uses, that, that tweets come from. And it's hard to read, but this is about 3 million tweets that come from um, developed high-intensity areas. And, uh, and then there, there actually were no lichens there. So Charles and I have been working our way through the Green Mountains trying to tweet from lichenous areas and move that far up. Uh, so, uh, so Aaron's made a few pictures uh, related to this where he takes you know, people who visited parks in San Francisco in this case and looked at tweets they posted in the park and then looked you know, the week before and after and is there some sort of effect of that dosing of nature on their well-being. And there doesn't appear to be much of a, a halo following it, um, but people do tweet 
remarkably happier stuff in the park even when we remove words that you might imagine seeing there. Uh, so that's pretty cool, and that's, that's ongoing work with, uh, with Taylor and, uh, and Jarlath and, and Aaron. Um, so we've also used this instrument to look at people's opinions of things. So that time series I showed you was just everything together, all in a big bag. But you could do something like take all the tweets that mention President Obama, for example, and look at the sentiment of the words that co-occur. And so we did that and, and found, in fact, that um, the average sentiment of those words is predictive of his approval rating three months later. And um, so that's one example where, in, in terms of public opinion, so here's a plot of that. So there's, for his uh, eight years in office, that's um, every quarter they do this, this survey, this public survey, and his approval rating and, and, and the sentiment of the tweets that mention him, um, they correlate at 0.75. And so people, people try and predict a lot of things with, with tweets. Um, this is something we're trying to do, actually more, more in this case to try and um, keep fresh our awareness of how people feel about things for the instrument itself, because the word Trump was one we asked people originally, if, you know, a room of 50 people on the internet to score for us, and uh, that was in 2012. So things change, and you know, people's opinions of things change in time, and we're trying to make real-time um, instruments that you can visit on the web and, and see how people are doing. We looked at climate tweets quite closely, actually. So a lot of them are this quote from Mark Twain, go to heaven for the climate and hell for the company. Uh, the president tweets a lot about the climate. Um, and so we, we thought, well, let's look at you know, what the sentiment of, of tweets mentioning the climate, uh, what they look like. And uh, it used to be more common that people would tweet about the climate, relatively speaking. And um, it's since Twitter, so over this whole period of time, it, it became less common for people to tweet about it. And the, the decay rate, um, one of the things we found is, you know, after a natural disaster, people tweet about it a lot, like Sandy, because it's a big populous area. But, um, but at least on Twitter, there's, there's so much other stuff going on that it dies off very quickly and has been dying off faster. It's not like the conversation lasts longer on Twitter now because, the, you know, it's 60 degrees in November or there's some big disaster. It's, it's actually um, slowing down um, so that was one of the things we looked at, and you know, words that people use more often in tweets about the climate, um, all these up arrows, science and energy and new, those are happy words used more often. Heaven's in there because of the Mark Twain, tweet, Mark Twain um, message. There's less laughing, less ha 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 in climate tweets. Um, denial is up, tax is up, hell's from the tweet um, from Twain again. And there's less profanity, less hate, less no less don't in tweets about the climate. So this is the sort of thing we, we can look at at the aggregate level. Um, so we do other things too. So we did this, you know, this sort of ongoing public opinion every day for thousands of words, like snow, for example. So we're happier about snow in the summer, at least not, you know, collectively in the US. And you know, we tweet sadder words about snow in the winter. Probably not in Vermont, but in, in parts of other parts of the world. Um, this negative event here was actually related to the Game of Thrones show, so that's a bit of an outlier. Uh, small spoiler there. Uh, so, okay, so one other instrument, I've, I've been talking about sentiment. We also are interested in, you know, how well society is functioning um, in terms of our, our um, exercise and, and uh, eating. So we made lists, or we collected lists um, from the literature of, of how many calories are associated with a single serving of about a thousand foods and how many calories you spend when you do about 10,000 activities, like sitting in a chair, or sleeping, or going for a run, or skiing. Um, and then we looked for how often those times those words appeared on Twitter. So we're turning tweets into calories, calories that you're putting in your body or spending. And then we looked uh, geographically at the ratio of those two. And if we're functioning really well, it, they should be in balance. Um, and it turns out they're not. We tweet a lot more about pizza uh, than we do about going for runs. Um, but that, that imbalance, while it's true for the whole U.S., um, is geographically correlates very strong with, with things you might care about for, for public health. So, for example, in Vermont, we, uh, we tweet about bacon a lot more often than other parts of the, of the U.S. And here's, a, um, here's this interactive one of these websites. So these are caloric foods that we tweet about more often and then activities we engage in more often than the rest of the U.S., and then uh, if we look at, you know, a state like Colorado, Colorado ended up having the best balance uh, for us, for this measure. But Mississippi, it was not so good. So they tweet about a lot of caloric foods in Mississippi. Um, see if I can get this right. So these are the, the foods that, that they're tweeting about more often than the rest. And this was last place, Mississippi. 
the dominant uh, caloric expend expenditure activity was eating in, in Mississippi. So they're, um, it's not running and dancing a lot less. It's e eating is the dominant thing there. And so we went you know, to look at the statistics, like is this going to tell us something we don't already know, or is it just tell us something we do know, but, but for cheap and in real time. And, um, and so we looked here, every state is, uh, is, is labeled here as a dot. So Colorado is the best, and Vermont was in third. This axis here in each of these pictures is, is that balance I mentioned. And then these are all things we care about for public health, like blood pressure or heart disease, diabetes, um, percentage that are overweight. And they also, Mississippi's is in the top left of all of these, and uh, it correlates again, it anti-correlates like this, so the more out of balance you are, the, the less healthy. And uh, the correlation's very strong, and it's something that you, know, you could imagine implementing if you're um, the governor of a state and you wanna know, you know how are your citizens doing, you don't have to wait three years for the hospital data to come back. Um, you can see it in real time because people are talking about what they eat and what they do. You may not be doing that, but people in Burlington eat the same things and do the same things you do. And uh, a lot of the science in this shows that um, for, you know, for things like this, it turns out that the, the community here, um, the people tweeting from this community, reflect a lot about what's going on here, even if it's not something that you're writing yourself. Um, and that, I mean, that's, that's shown by a picture like this. Um, okay, so that's, that's another one of our instruments, and now um, I had a few minutes left, and I wanted to um, talk about one of the projects we're working on to, to you know, take the, the phone that you may be using all the time to share things about your life and tell you something about yourself that could be helpful. So, um, so we recruited people who had been diagnosed with depression or PTSD by a psychiatrist and were active users of social media to be a part of a study, um, several hundred people. And we asked them for the, the date of their diagnosis and then access to all of their pictures, for example, that they posted or, or tweets that they sent. And, um, and so that, that was the idea. And the question was, you know, could we teach an algorithm to find differences between people who had been diagnosed and people who hadn't been diagnosed with those things on Instagram, just the average Instagram user? Um, and, uh, and, and maybe even could we find things that were different between those two groups before the date the person was diagnosed, indicating there would be some predictive information about their um, behavior that you know, could get them to a doctor sooner, that they might not even be aware of. So I'll say up front, I won't show you pictures by anyone in this study. We didn't look at the pictures by anyone in, involved in the study. Um, but what we found was that indeed there were big differences. So the people who had been diagnosed with depression their pictures were darker and bluer and grayer. They had uh, less faces in them. And those pictures, uh, those, those things were true even before the date that they were diagnosed formally. Um, and that's stuff that psychiatrists know about depression. People see the world, literally see the world with less color. They spend less time in social groups. And so their selfies that they take, you know, there may not be a bunch of people in them. They might not spend time like that. Um, we had an algorithm try and predict for, for uh, for this study, whether or not a picture was posted by somebody who was depressed or not, and it did, it did pretty well. Um, so filter use, uh, depressed participants used Inkwell, which is a black and white filter more often, and the uh, healthy participants used Valencia, which adds color to a photo and brightens it. A few people responded to this with you know, snapshots of their feeds before and after they had been diagnosed with depression. Um, this is one example of a person like that, and then um, some students at UVM agreed to share this uh, their own feeds with us, students who were active in um, combating stigma of mental health problems on campus. So this is a student who had been diagnosed with depression um, and her pictures, and this is a student who had not been diagnosed with depression. And you don't really even need to look at the content of these pictures. If you sort of blur your eyes, which is effectively what we had the, the machine do, just look at the average pixel color, count the number of faces in the pictures, which I've blurred here, but there are a lot more in the, in the account on the right. And these were typical, this is sort of like what you got when you landed on their pages. Um, and this is the sort of thing that, you know, these people, you know, the people who are suffering from depression may have no idea that their pictures are of dark things. I mean, they, this is something that um, they might not actively be doing, but it's something that could be picked up on by, um, by an algorithm. We did the same thing for, for tweets, looking for differences between people's uh, messages before um, before and after their date of diagnosis and, and trained an algorithm to be able to predict those differences and they were um, 
those elements were present prior to the date of diagnosis. And with PTSD, similarly, the, the red curve is um, for, for those, those participants. The date of their traumas is where they're all tied together here. Um, and there are changes visible to the algorithm that we trained on data that we then um, use a different data set to, to validate against uh, from the same people. Um, you know, they're diagnosed with PTSD a full year and a half after the date of their trauma on average. And our algorithm is picking up on a difference in their behavior right after their traumatic event. And this is the sort of thing that, you know, that your phone is um, certainly capable of integrating information like this, your GPS trace as you walk around. You know, that can be diminished if you're spending more time at home. Uh, your tone of voice can be changing. Your social network, the, the size of the people you communicate with could be shrinking. And these are all things that um, you know, passively could be collected by the phone and sent to your doctor if it, if it appears to be in line with the previous, you know, the 100,000 people that we've seen uh, be diagnosed with depression in the past or PTSD. Um, so there's obviously a lot of privacy concerns there because you know, an employer, for example, or Instagram themselves could be doing this very same thing and showing you ads for drugs uh, before you have visited a doctor, for example. So um, part of the role of our work is to show what's possible so that the companies who don't have incentives to make their algorithms public um, so that they're you know, held to account for what they're able to do and, and we know about it. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna pause there and say um, that's probably good for now and if anybody has questions, I'm happy to, to talk more about details and other things, yeah. All of those, I didn't make any of those pictures. Um, <laughs> I, so these are all students in our lab, many of whom uh, you might recognize because they've uh, been over on this side of campus at times. A lot of them are now working at companies like Facebook and Instagram um, and, and, or have gone on to PhD programs elsewhere. Or, um, but one of the great things that I'd like to say about it is that almost all of them want to come back here. And, uh, and that's because UVM is a really awesome community to be a part of and we try really hard to find ways to make them able to come back here. But, um, Anyway, so thanks to all, all of these people who have contributed, uh, the students in our group and, uh, and Peter. So.